So today is for you if you are a stay-at-home mom or even if you're not a stay-at-home mom, but specifically, I want to thank Kimberly for letting me come into her community and talk to you as a stay-at-home mom because for the modern-day stay-at-home mom, it really is everything for us to figure out how we can make our life easier and the clutter in our home, whether we realize how it's stressing us out or not our brain sees it. And so even if we don't feel like it's stressing us out, which we probably do feel that way half the time, um, because as women, we carry around the weight of what our home looks like and what's going on at home and the to-do list we still need to do and all of those sorts of things. And so the reason I came in to talk to you guys today and to do this workshop is to help you even if you just walk away with a few nuggets that you can use and implement in your home to help take that stress away and to make your life so much easier. It is a little more work on the front end to get everything decluttered and organized, but once you get it there, it makes your life so much easier. So first, let me introduce myself. My name is Samantha Brown. I am a professional organizer and decluttering specialist in Knoxville, Tennessee, and I also have a podcast and a group coaching community where I help other women start their organizing businesses because I love what I am able to do. And I love it so much that now I teach it to other women. So let's talk about the decluttering plan. Okay. So first off, let me go ahead and click here. Introduction. I introduced myself. So no matter what the steps are of getting yourself decluttered and getting your home organized, the very first thing is actually your thoughts. So I wanted to take just a minute and look at our thoughts and share the thought model with you. So when I first started my organizing business, I very quickly realized how our thoughts and the emotional connection we have to items is a big part of helping someone declutter and organize. So I went and got certified as a life coach. And as I was going through that certification, one of the biggest thing that I learned was the thought model. So I wanted to make sure to share that with you because it really does matter what thoughts we are thinking in our daily life as to the results that we are going to get in our life. So the thought model goes like this. It's the circumstance that is happening, whatever that circumstance is, like, you know, you're a mom or you're a wife or, you know, you have a home or those are facts, they're circumstances, they're things that are happening. But your thought about that circumstance is what ends up giving you your result and your belief about the result. So the thought which you can actually choose your thoughts. So if, if you are thinking something and you can start catching yourself thinking it, you can actually choose a better thought that serves you better. So I just wanted you to be aware that your thought gives you your feelings. Your feeling, feelings give you your action or inaction. Your action or inaction gives you your result, which turns into your belief but it all stems from your thought about the circumstance. And so the more that we can catch our thoughts and choose a better one, the better our life is going to be and the better beliefs that we're going to have. And so I also wanted to make sure to share my life verse with you, which kind of encompasses the thought model, in my opinion, which essentially just says, like, be anxious for nothing be thankful, and that the God of peace, which surpasses all understanding, will guard our hearts, but then focus our thoughts on whatever is true and lovely and pure and of good report, and if there's any virtue, focus on those things so we can have peace and joy in our lives. All right, let's get to the actual organizing and decluttering. So I I set this up to where it is a five-step process, which is normally the steps that I help take my clients through, whether it's in person or virtually. And the, um, the first step, of course, is assess and plan. And then you have sort and categorize. Then you have purge, then organize, and then maintain. So the problem for a lot of us is that we 
naturally want to jump straight to the organizing. Like we want to go buy the bins and the baskets and which is great. Like it's fun. I love it. We all love it. The problem is, is if we haven't done the first few steps first, before we get to the organizing, it doesn't matter how many bins or baskets you buy, they're actually going to become more clutter in your home. And so the first step is to actually take a step back and assess and plan. So you want to begin by taking a look at your space and understanding the extent of the clutter and identifying those specific areas or hot spots that you would like to declutter and organize. So for me, when I first started this journey of learning how to organize for my, my own home, the two areas for me were my master closet and my pantry. They drove me nuts. I would be sitting at work thinking about how awful <laughs> they were. I would walk past my master closet and like, my clothes would end up in piles around my bedroom because I didn't want to have to open the door to the master closet. And so I finally got to the point where I was like, okay, no, 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 I need to tackle this. And once I did, the weight that came off of my shoulders is why I started this business in the first place and what I want to help you be able to do in your home. So the objective is to understand the scope of your clutter and then create a realistic plan. So step one would be to walk through your home with a notebook, identifying those clutter hotspots we just talked about, and then jot them down the specific areas that you want to focus on. Because when you think of your entire home as one big project, you're going to be so overwhelmed that you're going to end up watching Netflix, <laughs> or at least I would. So, and the tip on this is to visualize your ideal home environment. How does it make you feel? And use that as motivation, the way that you want to feel when you come home versus how you're feeling now. The step two of assess and plan is actually to take before photos. So when I'm working with clients, I actually take a before photo one, so I have the before and after photos, but the main reason is because I actually like to show the before photos to my clients once we're done organizing that area because our brains see our homes and we almost get clutter blindness. But when we look at it in a photo, we can see it so much more clearly. And so you want to make sure to take those before photos and also, so once you get done, you can look back and see how far you've come. So step three, create a decluttering schedule. So you could either break the tasks down into daily manageable goals, dedicating like 15 to 30 minutes each day, or you can do like I did and take like one weekend and go one area at a time. The thing is, is you want to have a plan. And whatever that plan is, you want to stick to it. If doing it all in one day, like one whole room in one day is too overwhelming for you, that's okay. Take it in smaller chunks. But just remember that as long as you are making progress and as long as you have a plan, then you're able to stick to it. So the kind of life coaching tip for this step is to set smart goals. And what I mean by that is they are specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and you put a time frame on them. And that helps keep you on track. And then step four of the assess and plan is to mentally prepare for the journey. Reflect on how the clutter affects your life and visualize the peaceful organized home that you want to achieve. You can also practice like the thoughts that we talked about. You can also practice saying things like, I am capable of creating an organized home. You want to watch what you're saying to yourself and the thoughts you're thinking. So you can achieve that because if you start thinking things like, man, this is just too much. I just can't do it. Or I'm never going to get this done. Then you're probably not. And so just be aware of the thoughts you're thinking and the, the words that are coming out of your mouth as you go through this process. All right, step two, 
and I totally should have been doing the slides. My bad. Assess and plan. <laughs> Those are the um, things I just went over, mentally prepare for the journey. And now we're on to step two. So step two is sort and categorize. So once you have a clear plan, the next step is to sort and categorize your belongings. You want to begin by emptying the space and grouping like items with like items. You also want to categorize. So when you're doing this on your own, it looks a little different than when you're working with an organizer. When you're doing it on your own, you want to have the piles of keep, donate, sell, and trash or discard. For me with my clients, the reason that it's so helpful to have someone there with you is I actually have my clients just make the choice of either keep or release. And if they say release, then I choose if it goes into donation or trash because it can become a little overwhelming having four separate piles. And we'll talk about the selling part of this in a minute, because if you don't plan on selling anything or you don't really need to, it's actually better just to have the three choices because you don't want to overwhelm yourself. You want to make this as simple as possible. So the categorization ensures that similar items will be grouped together, which can help you identify duplicates and unnecessary items. This step is pivotal because it brings a sense of order and allows you to focus on each category individually, making the decision-making process more straightforward and less overwhelming, which is absolutely what we're all about here. So we're going to begin sorting through items and creating those categor categories to simplify the process. Now, step one of the sort and categorize is you want to start small. So you want those little small wins in the beginning, like maybe it's just a drawer that you start with. That's okay. That's progress, right? And so you want to start small, making it something very simple, a drawer, a shelf, something small. And then a little tip for this is if you can try to use the one touch rule, which is you handle each item once. So making that decision now, sometimes there's some stuff that kind of need to go in the maybe pile because it's it's you're just like, I don't know. It's okay to create a maybe pile. Just make sure you come back to that maybe pile at the end and actually make the decisions for it. Step two, you want to sort like items with like items so that you can see what you have of that category. This makes purging a lot easier. Because I tell my clients all the time, if you are like, ooh, I need some white tank tops, but you have a white tank top in this room and three white tank tops in that room and four in the other room, every time you come across a, a white tank top, you're going to be like, ooh, I need one of those. But if you have them all together, grouped together, you're going to be like, I don't need 40 white tank tops. I just need like five. So it's a lot easier to purge when you can see how many of something you have all in one area. Step three, you would then want to move on to a larger area after you've got some momentum going. That's when you want to maybe try a larger area. And then you literally just want to continue sorting room to room. A little tip, you can set a timer and the other tip is turn on some music, make it fun. This does not have to be a stressful situation. Like you can have a good time doing these things, right? And the reason that a timer is helpful is because it's a lot easier to get things done if you know you only have a set amount of time that you're going to have to do that task. And that's why we want to start small and then work our way to the bigger projects. Now, an emotional note that I wanted to make sure to mention is that sorting can unearth memories and emotions. Allow yourself to feel them, but remember, keeping memories does not require keeping every physical item with them. A lot of times we can thank it or we can take a photo of it and then still release that item because then the photo is going to pop up and it's going to remind us we don't have to necessarily keep the emotional item just because it made us feel some sort of way. All right, let's go to step number three, which is purge. This is the big one that 
most people want to skip over. And I get it. It's a hard thing to do when you are having to make decisions and releasing items. And most of the items you're like, oh, but I like those clothes. Well, of course you do. You bought them. So they're going to be something that you like or you wouldn't have bought them in the first place. But the more you can learn to purge and release, the better you are going to feel. A lot of us, I feel like we're taught that you need to collect more. Like the more that you have, the better off you're going to be. When really that's not the case. Having space is what makes it feel luxurious. It's what makes it feel organized. And it's, it's what gives us peace is when there is empty space in places. Just because it's an empty space does not mean that we have to fill it with things. So just be aware of that as you go through the purging process, because I promise you, I've been doing this for years and every single client I've worked with, the more they are willing to release the better that they feel. And specifically with clothes, because as women, the clothes are kind of a, you know, as Americans, it has been proven that we wear 20% of our clothes 80% of the time. So if you think about it, you have your same clothes that you kind of go to, whether it's for work or for working out or for, you know, hanging out with the kids, whatever. You have those same ones that you go to time and time again. And then you have those other clothes that have been in the closet for three years. If you are doing a closet, one other like kind of tip that you can do is you can actually turn the hangers backwards. And then over the next year, when you wear that item, you can flip the hanger forwards. And then one year from the day that you purge your closet, you can visually see the items that are still on hangers backwards which should then let you know, hey, I've not worn this in a whole year. I probably am not going to wear it. All right. So speaking of purging, no matter what area it is, we want to remove unnecessary items from our home. We want the peace. We want the space back. We want to clear that clutter. So the objective is to remove the unnecessary items. And then step one is you want to decide where you would like to donate so it makes it, the releasing a lot easier. For a lot of us, if there's a purpose behind where we are releasing the items to, like if we find a place that it's like for abused women and children, and maybe that's something that, you know, really is, is a heartfelt thing for us, like we really want to help abused women and children. It's so much easier as we're going through our items to think, okay, I can bless someone else with this stuff versus, oh, I've got to hold on to all of this, right? And so just making sure that you pick a place that you would enjoy donating to so you can release more items as you go through the process. And then step two is look at each category one at a time and decide how many of items that you need for that category. So you can kind of ask yourself, does this item serve a purpose or does it bring me joy? If the answer is no to either one or to both of those, it's probably something that you can release, right? Because if it's not something that makes us happy or that we love versus, oh, I like that thing, but like, oh, I love that thing. Okay, then, you know, you can keep it. Why not? Or does it serve a purpose? Like a spatula is not really going to bring me joy, but I need a spatula to be able to cook for my family. So that kind of helps break down the items of what you actually need to keep versus what you can release. And then step three, you want to make sure to arrange for a charity to pick up the items or set a date that you're going to drop off the items to a charity. When we give ourselves a time limit, it makes the process so much, like it keeps us on track for making sure that we get this process done. And it's the same with selling items, which... So if you decide to have a sell pile, right? If you're like, Samantha, I have to get some money back for these. Or especially when it's kids clothes, like they sell pretty well on Facebook, like in lots of like 2T boys clothes or whatever. 
my advice to you would be make sure that you put a date on it. If these items or this lot that I've posted has not sold by, I don't care if it's three months from now, but whatever that date is, if it's not sold by that date, go ahead and release it because until it sells or until you choose to release it, it is still taking up space in your home, which is still stressing you out. I personally like to plant seeds. So I love God. I know that he, everything is, is for my good and for my purpose. And so for his purpose, for my good. But whenever I release something, I'm like, God, please let this bless someone else that really needs it. And can we please plant it as a seed towards my business growing or towards my family, you know, whatever it is that I'm praying about at that given time. And it helps me give it a purpose and let it go. So the emotional note that I wanted to make sure to mention to you all is that purging is about letting go of what no longer serves us. Embrace the liberation and the new space for positive energy and experiences. A lot of us want our space to be organized and to feel peace when we are at home and and all of the things that we talked about in step one, like those goals and the why and, and emotionally why you want this for your home and for your family. But then if every item you come across, you're like, Ooh, I might use that one day, or I could use that. The problem is, is your home is only so many square feet. And so you can only keep so many items. And the more items that you keep, the less likely you're going to get to that goal of feeling the peace and feeling the joy. It's time to let it go. And the more you let it go, I promise you, the better you're going to feel. All right, now let's get to the fun step, organizing. So when you go to organize your space, like I said in the beginning, a lot of us just go to Target or we go to wherever and we get a bunch of bins and baskets because we like the look of them and we think, oh, well, we're going to bring it home and that's going to get us organized. The problem is, is there's actually, you know, first the purging, like you have to purge first so you know what's going back into that space so you know what bins or baskets to get to organize with. But then the other thing is that most of us don't realize that there are actually different aesthetics to organizing. So I wanted to make sure to bring those up to you today. And I just, I really like this quote, a place for everything and everything in its place. Like that is the goal, which I know it's hard with young kids, but we can make your life a lot easier by releasing things. And it helps to where our kids can actually then help us clean up as well, because there's not like everything has a place to go. And so then our kids can even like we can teach them how to become organized. So it follows them into their adulthood as well. All right. So whenever you are creating an efficient and aesthetically pleasing system, you want to assign a home or a spot for each item. You want to organize one area at a time. You want to implement storage solutions. Then you want to take after photos. And then you want to look back at your before photos. So assigning a home for everything. If you go to put stuff back into an area, like for instance, let's say the closet. If you go to, if the closet is meant to, let's say, be the size of something that would hold a hundred hangers and it would look good, there'd still be a little bit of space to move them around. But then you're like, ooh, I want to keep 200 items and I'm going to cram them all in this closet. Okay, well, you've given it a home or a spot, but it's still not going to feel organized because there's too many items in that space. So just being aware of the, the places and the spaces that you have to work with and then making those decisions based on the space that you're working with. So assigning a home and then when you organize um, one room at a time, starting with the areas you use most frequently, you want to label bins and drawers to keep track of these items. And that's the organizing one area at a time. You don't want to, like a lot of my clients, when I go help them, 
one of the main tasks that I am there to do is to help them stay focused on one area at a time. Because if we pick up something and we're like, ooh, that belongs in the dining room, and then we get, end up in the dining room, then we get distracted by a pile in the dining room, we start going through that, and then we end up, you know, and before you know it, none of them got fully done. So if you focus on one area at a time, then you work your way through one area. Don't allow yourself to get distracted because it's going to make it feel like you're not making progress. I promise. All right, now let's talk about implementing the storage solutions. This is what I was talking about a minute ago when I was saying there's actually different aesthetically pleasing, like some of us like things one way, others of us like it another. But the society we live in right now has pretty much taught us like, oh, we'll just go buy bins and baskets and throw stuff in there and pop a label on it and you're good to go. While that works for some of us, is it maintainable? And that's the other piece of this puzzle for us as stay-at-home moms is that we want to make sure that it is very easily manageable and that our kids can help us manage it. Our husbands can help us manage it, right? And so you don't want to just start getting bins and baskets and just throwing all these random things in there and then putting it on a shelf and being like, okay, it's organized. <laughs> like, because then still they're going to be coming to you like, mom, where's that such and such, right? And so when it comes to the, vi like implementing the storage solutions, once you know what you want in each area and what needs to go back into that area, like the closet, for instance, or certain drawers, then you need to decide, are you someone that likes to visually see things or are you someone that if it's out of sight, it's actually out of mind. So you need to think about that as you create the systems. Like, do you need maybe more open shelving? Do you need more clear containers? Because you need to be able to see what you have or you're going to forget that it's there. Or are you someone that kind of like in this hidden photo right here, you don't want to see it. And so you would actually rather have like the wooden baskets and something that is going to help kind of hide the the topics and, and the stuff that's inside, because to you, that feels more organized. The other kind of thing that you need to be aware of is, are you a macro organizer? Like, would do you prefer and would it be easier for you and your family to have like everything just thrown in the basket and then the basket on the shelf, maybe you pop a label below the basket, right? Or are you someone that it's actually micro makes you feel better and is more, is easier for you to maintain? Then you're going to want to get the things that divide inside of those bins and baskets. So being aware of what feels better for you and what type of person you naturally are is going to help you in the long term because then it's going to feel better for you. It's going to be easier to maintain. So I just wanted you to be aware that there are those different options of like being organized. It's not always clear bins and baskets with a label on them, even though those are beautiful, <laughs> but you get the point. All right. So step four is of the organizing is you want to take a moment to step back and be happy about the work you've done and take your after photos. So then you're able to look back at those before photos and give yourself a pat on the back, like feel the win. And even if like you do this whole process and let's say you've only done it for your pantry. Well, if, you know, when you're looking at that pantry, that's going to give you energy. That's going to feel good to you. So then it's a lot easier to move on to the kids room or the kids playroom or the master closet, right? Like once you get one area or one room fully done, you're going to be able to see what works for me. What doesn't, what do I maybe want to do a little differently next time in the next room? Organizing really is a big, huge puzzle, right? So like you have to do step one and you have to kind of like with a puzzle, you got to figure out the outside first with organizing, you have to do those first steps of like planning and making sure that you're purging, like you have to go through and declutter. Then you can get to the fun organizing part and the labels and the bins and baskets and all of that. 
The other piece is you want to make sure to measure. A lot of us don't measure the area that we're buying the bins and baskets for. We're just at the store and like, oh, that's a cute basket or a bin. And let me just get that one. If you don't take the time to think it through and plan for it, it a lot of times you like lose space in the back because you didn't get the correct bin for that area. And so it, you know, it doesn't go all the way back or it doesn't look right. Or, you know, if you're going to do this, let's do it correctly and let's do it in a way that's going to feel good for you because this is going to help you want for years to come. I have clients that call me and they've been like, Samantha, it's been over a year and my closet still looks exactly the way it did when you left. Because once we got it organized, I was able to maintain it and life has been so much easier. And that's the goal. We want to make life so much easier for you. You're a mom. You have lots going on. Let's just make it as easy as possible, right? So then that brings us to step five, which is maintaining. So the final step in decluttering is the maintenance. Establishing daily and weekly routines to keep the areas clutter-free. Regularly assessing your belongings and repeating the decluttering step as often as necessary, and then developing habits that you use all the time to help keep it maintained. Maintenance is an ongoing process that does require commitment and being mindfulness of it. But by integrating these practices into your daily life, you can ensure that your home remains that organized, peaceful sanctuary that you are after and that you deserve. So how do we develop the maintaining schedule or process, right? So step one is create the daily cleaning checklist, right? Because, you know, even if it's something as simple as, you know, every night before bed, we're going to pick up our toys, kids, or we're going to, you know, do the dishes real quick, or we're going to, whatever those little things are, or like when I come home from the grocery store, everyone's going to help out and we're going to put everything where it goes instead of leaving it as a big pile on the counter. It's establishing those little things that it's, you know, it's a pain at first to get the family involved and to get it going. But the second we do, it just becomes a way of life and it makes our life so much easier because then we're not the only ones doing it. Our family can get involved because then they have the information that they need of what's expected of them and how to get that task accomplished. So establishing weekly routines involving your family, um, the establishing weekly routines, if you will dedicate specific days for deeper cleaning and maintenance tasks, right? Uh, maybe it's, you know, whatever Saturday we have available or whatever every other Thursday evening, we're going to actually like get down, it down and clean out the fridge or clean out the whatever, and it be those deeper cleaning items. It's going to help the maintenance of it long-term. And then step three, involving your family, assigning those age appropriate chores to teach responsibility and teamwork. And then the tip for that is using positive reinforcement and celebrating your family's contributions to maintain a clutter-free home. I did not do this. My kids are now in high school and looking back, like I wish I would have done this sooner. One thing that I found for even my husband, unfortunately, hello, and the kids is that when I created a list that was like on the wall for them to visually see it made it so much easier because then they were able to see what was expected of them instead of me just having it in my head and assuming that they knew. The second I put it on like a dry erase board for them to see, it made a world of difference in my house. And then on top of that, it's just about having those conversations with your family. Like, guys, this is a lot on me. I, you know, we have activities, we have all the things going on all the time. And so every day we need to do these little things. And then every other week, you know, we'll have a list that we pull from that we do these kind of deeper cleaning things, right? And then 
step four is you want to regularly reassess and adjust. So this is an ongoing process. Nothing is ever going to be 100% organized and stay that way forever. This is something that you have to continue to, to manage and maintain and reassess. Is this working? Is it not? Do we maybe need to tweak a few things? But if you will stay on it, it becomes all these little small manageable tasks instead of this big, huge, overwhelming thing that you don't even know where to start. It makes life so, so much better and it makes it better for our families because then mom's not nearly as stressed out screaming at everyone, <laughs> at least in my case. All right. So the emotional note for this one is maintenance is about preserving the harmony that you have created, feeling proud of your accomplishments and the peaceful environment that you are nurturing. So in conclusion, we have decluttering is a transform transformative journey. And as you navigate through each step, embrace the growth and the sense of achievement. It really is a process and you want to make sure that your home is a reflection of the love and the care that you have for your family and you deserve to enjoy coming home. You deserve to not feel stressed when you pull up in the driveway because of all the things that you know you have to do. When you create these systems and when you go through the steps and you get things organized and decluttered, it makes it to where when you come home, you know what to expect. And it can stay, for the most part, pretty organized, right? I mean, we have kids, so give or take. But for the most part, it's not nearly as overwhelming as it is before you start this process. So I wanted to share with you a couple before and afters that I've done with my clients. And I just wanted you to take note of the way that it looks in the before and how that would feel opening that door. And then the way it looks after, it's not Pinterest perfect, but it's organized. Everything has a place and it just feels better. And then I wanted to share these with you too. So like, it's about knowing where things are. It's not about it being Pinterest perfect. It's literally just about making sure that it feels good. You've decluttered, you know what you have and the thing that you know you that you own, you know where to go to get it. <laughs> so you're not spending an hour every day looking for the keys or looking for the shoes or, you know, all the things that we have that end up happening when we are not organized. And so it really is such it's a journey, but it's a journey that is worth it. And so I just wanted to share with you really quickly, I do virtual and in-person sessions. If you are needing someone to talk it out with, I do virtual sessions. You can go to my website and it says virtual sessions. You can click that and set up a one hour one-on-one -on -one coaching session with me. Um, and then I also do in-person sessions here in Knoxville. I've had clients literally tell me like in three hours, I, we've gotten more done than I've gotten done in three months because when you set aside the time to get something done and we're working together and talking it through and turning on music and having fun, all of a sudden that area is done and you're like, oh my gosh, why did I not do this sooner, right? So I know we are giving away a offer for, oh, hey, um, Kimberly, did you want to jump back on and us do it that way? Or actually, yes. let, oh, there you are. I, yes, I Yay. am here. Um, yeah, so we can give away a, um, a free session if you want to do that. I know we don't have a, a lot on here. Well, that's okay. So I know Yolanda's my lady, like she's from my group, but there's two people that are on here. Um, and so, um, the other, the other one that's Betty, that's my mom's. <laughs> So oh, that hey, mom. Little, <laughs> that might be a little unfair. Okay. Uh, but so Azara, is she a member on your um in your website and on your like membership? It, I'm not sure. Are you? I've got so many in there. <laughs> Drop in the chat and let me know. Yes, she is. Yay. So Azara, you win the free virtual organizing session. <laughs> so awesome. yeah. Um Oh yeah, I just now saw the chat. My bad, guys. <laughs> um, so 
Azra, if you will, like I'm in the Facebook group as well. Um, participation trophy. <laughs> <laughs> well, well no, you know, hey, it's it's that's just what happens when we have uh when we don't have a lot show up. So it makes it easier for those to do. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, and honestly, um, Azra, if you want to actually, I'll go back um and write down. Right there is my email. And so if you just maybe want to email me like your information and then we can kind of go from there. Um, and then I, I can send you my link so you can set up the day and time that works best for you and figure out what area of your home that you would like to hit in a session to be able to virtually like I can talk it out with you. We can look at it. Um, it's just nice having someone else that kind of sees things differently than we do. And so if you have a specific area that is like stressing you out or that, um, or you even have a few little hot spots that are bothering you, then we can totally get those things talked out and done. Um, and virtual organizing sessions normally go one of two ways, either a, you set and do the actual work while I'm there and we focus on one area. Or I've actually had one lady that did a virtual session with me that she was like, listen, I just need the ideas. I'm going to show you. And she showed me like three different spaces in one session and just talking it out with me. She had like a list of her homework that she was going to complete after the virtual session. So either way, whatever works best for you, I just want to be a blessing to you and help you organize your home.